So now we're going to make some small changes to the split phase design that we just presented and we're going to use those small changes to derive the utility of the three-phase system. Why do we use the three-phase system? So this really is the derivation of the rationale behind the use of three phases in the modern system. So imagine that we make one small change and what that is going to, uh, what that change is going to be is we're going to uh, adjust the phase shift between these two voltage sources uh, where previously they didn't have any phase shift between them. Uh, now we're going to introduce this 120 degrees of phase shift just by adjusting the relative timing of the uh, bottom uh, generator as uh, as referred to the top generator, right? So we've got 120 degrees of phase. 120 at angle zero and 120 at 120. So now let's look at the two circuits independently. In the top circuit we see that 120 volts has to be dropped across this resistor and it's going to be 120 volts at angle zero, right? According to KVL. Voltage all around the closed loop has to sum to zero. So if this is 120 volts at angle zero, that also has to be at 120 volts at angle zero. So if I want to calculate the current, I, this, I then just take 120 volts at angle zero. And assuming this is that real kilowatt load that we described earlier, 120 angle zero divided by some R, uh, we ended up finding out that that was, that, remember that was 10 kilowatts, so that gives us 83.33 uh, 3 amps of um, current, but that's only the current magnitude. Uh, it's a resistive load, so the voltage and current, or sorry, the, uh, yeah, the voltage and current are in phase. So it's 133 at angle zero degrees. A similar analysis can be applied to this bottom circuit, right? We've got 120 volts at 120. That means the voltage drop across this resistive element, this 10 kilowatt resistive element, is 120 at angle 120. That means the magnitude of the current flowing in this bottom circuit is going to be 83 0.33 degrees, but its phase angle, voltage and current have to be in phase in the resistive load, so its phase angle is going to be 120. All right, so those are both current measurements. So we've got a 10 kilowatt load connected here. It's drawing 83.33 uh, amps at angle zero, and we've got a 10 kilowatt load here, and we've got uh, a um, current draw of 83.33 at angle 120. So we've determined the currents that flow, but what about the um, uh, voltage as measured across the terminals? Well, that's a little bit, uh, that's a little bit more complicated. We'll actually have to do a, a little bit of vector math there. Um, although we're going to use the same technique as we used in the split case scenario, we'll just sum KVL, right? So 120 volts at angle zero plus the voltage drop here minus 120 angle 20 is uh, well is got to be equal to zero. So we just rearrange that and we say um, 120 at an angle of zero degrees minus 120 at an angle of 120 degrees. That's got to be equal to this uh, V load here. So that's just an application of Kirchhoff's voltage law. And the result of that is that the load voltage, uh, as measured across both loads in this split, or in this uh, um, 120 degree out of phase voltage scenario that we've kind of made up here, is going to be 207.85 volts. At an angle of negative 30 degrees. So when those two voltage sources were in phase, we got 240 at an angle zero here, but put them 120 degrees out of phase, and we see that the magnitude reduces and the phase angle is introduced. So we get uh, 207.85 at an angle negative 30. Typically, this is called 208, 208 volts. So if I put a load across here, I get 120 volts. If I put a load across here, I get 120 volts. If I put a load across here, I get 208 volts. Um, we can also use uh, Kirchhoff's current law to determine the current flowing in this neutral wire. And this is actually what gives us some surprising results. Uh, if we were to sum the current uh, flowing here, we would see that uh, there's current flowing out, there's current flowing in, there's current flowing in. So we say I load 1 plus I load 2 plus I neutral is equal to 0 amps, right? The sums of all these currents flowing into this node are 0. Uh, so I'm just going to clear my slide real fast. I load 1 plus I 
load 2, that's the current flowing in this direction, notice the positive sign points this direction, so this loop flow actually flows this way, this loop flow flows this way, so those are both entering that node. Uh, if we were to take the neutral as entering the node plus I neutral, those have to sum to 0, that means neutral is flowing in that direction from that. Um, so that's 83.33 amps at an angle of zero. That's 83.33 amps at 120. And we don't know the neutral current. Those all have to sum to zero. And what we find out is that uh, the neutral current is actually going to be 83.33 at angle 240. Uh, you could also write that as 83.33 amps at an angle of negative 120 degrees. So um, unlike our previous analysis, the neutral current is now has to carry uh, 83, a magnitude of 83.33 amps, which it needs to be rated to the full load, which is not what we saw in the previous split phase supplies. So um, it seems like we have lost the benefit, right? Those currents are no longer canceling, and the reason they're not canceling anymore is because of the phase relationship. We introduced this phase relationship we reduce the magnitude of the voltage across the two terminals, and we no longer get that benefit of uh, cancellation in the neutral line. So that seems to be negative, but there's an interesting engineering approach that we can take at this point, and that is what if we, this is already carrying full current, what if we added a third, uh, third phase? What would happen if we were to add a third phase? And that's exactly what we've done in this diagram here. We've added a third phase. So we've got a voltage source 120 angle 0, a voltage source 120 angle 120, and a voltage source 120 angle 240. So the, I'll just tell you kind of straight away, the addition of um, this uh, third generator allows us to add a third load without increasing the total current as compared to uh, this example here. So uh, this arrangement of the three voltage sources all with their negative terminals connected uh, at a um, uh, common location, um, same voltage magnitudes separated by 120 degrees of phase is called the three phase system. I'm going to hold off right now for, on performing a full mathematical analysis of the voltages and currents in this circuit and I just really want to first concentrate on a conceptual analysis of the uh, circuit elements involved here. And what we're going to do is we're going to begin this kind of conceptual analysis by looking at, well, what if I, instead of having this circuit here where everything's already connected, let's just break it into three constituent circuits where I have voltage sources and loads that are the same as in this circuit, but they're just not connected together. Um, each of these circuits is going to require two conductors, one uh, from the source uh, from, for the current from the source to the load, and then one for the current from the load to the source. Um, so that's six wires total. So you can just one, two, three, four, five, six. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and what we can, what we'll show is that um, if we were to adjust the uh, uh, the phase timing just so, we can cause the complex sum of the resultant currents to go to zero. Um, to understand the reason why the sums of these currents goes to zero, we have to consider the relative timing and magnitude of the current flows here. So a, um, a sinusoidal voltage source such as A, B, or C here is going to produce a sinusoidal current. Um, 
if ZA, ZB, and ZC are equal, the phases of these currents, well, let me step back. The phase difference between the current and the, volt, the, current and the voltage in each of these circuits will be the same. If ZA, ZB, and ZC are the same, and A, B, and C are the same magnitude, just different phases, the phase difference, the phase separation, the phase angle between voltage and current is going to be constant all in, in all of these circuits. Um, in our case, because this, we're going to assume this is resistive and this is 120 degrees, there's going to be 120 degrees of phase separation in the currents as well. Um, what we've plotted here are three sine waves. Um, and what we'll notice is that at 120 degrees phase separation, they'll always add up to zero. So let's take, just pick a point here. We'll pick uh, the phase one, which is black. That's phase A. Its value um, at this point is one, and the value of the other two at that point are both negative 0.5. If I were to sum those currents, one amp plus minus 0.5 amps plus minus 0.5 amps, I get zero amps. Let's just pick a, a second point on the curve. Um, let's go to a zero crossing. That's kind of instructive. So uh, phase three here has uh, zero amps of current. Phase one, it looks like it's got about 0.8 amps of current. And phase two has minus 0.8 amps of current. Uh, so they all add um, to, again, to uh, uh, z uh, zero amps. And so it's it's the combination of the magnitudes and the phases that allow, if I were to just take these currents as vector quantities and add them all together, at every time the summation of these three current waveforms is going to add to zero. This could also be seen uh, by representing the currents as phasors, as in the diagram here. So I've got uh, three current vectors that I'm, that I'm adding together. Um, I've got uh, the uh, first current, and assuming that they're of equal amplitude, the first current is the reference, so it's got uh, zero degrees of uh, phase shift. Uh, the second current is 120 degrees with respect to the first current, and then the second current is uh, 240 degrees with respect to the first current. And if I add all of those together, I get, assuming that they have the same magnitude, which will be the case of Z, A, B, C, Z, A, Z, B, and Z, C are the same. If I add those three vectors together, I get back to the origin, uh, showing that those vec because of the direction of the vectors, those are going to uh, cancel. Well, what this means in terms of a physical system is that we can bundle the return wires of the three circuits, this wire, this wire, and this wire, um, and simply let the return currents cancel each other out. Combining the neutral wire into one wire results in a current of zero, and no current flows in that wire. So if I arrange a circuit like this, we get a uh, neutral that carries no current, and this results in the most common three-phase diagram, um, which is the same circuit that we presented earlier. We've got 120, that would be ZA, and then this is, there would be a, like a neutral wire here, right? Um, this would be ZA, this would be ZB, this would be ZC, but no current flows in this wire, so it can just be eliminated. And so we do that and we end up with that circuit. So we can actually extend this approach to do the same with any number of phases uh, using equal amplitude voltages and evenly spaced cycles in terms of time. For example, we could create four circuits instead of having three circuits. We could have done it with four uh, phases. We would have had four voltage sources um, we would have had four wires, we would have had four loads. What would have changed in that realization was that instead of 120 volt, instead of dividing 360 into three separate, we would have had to divide it into four intervals. So 360 divided by four, um, separate that into four intervals. Uh, it, with five circuits, you would have had five voltage sources, five wires, five loads, and you would have uh, divided that into um, 72 degree um, phase shifts, but uh, 
You don't actually have to remember all that. You just have to remember that for the three-phase system, 120 uh, degrees of phase shift. Well, why do we settle on this, though? Why didn't we pick, you know, five or six or seven if they're possible? So, um, well, clearly, uh, it was a compromise between the reduction of vulnerability in the system due to unbalanced loading amongst the phases. The more phases I have, the less vulnerable the system is. And then there was also an increase in capital cost of equipment for polyphase loads. You know, I got to add generators, I got to add wires and things like that. Um, Later, we're going to see that there are significant advantages for the use of three phases for a machine called an AC generator. Um, and so low capital costs, the redundancy provided by the three phases, um, the practicality of the three phase generator, which we haven't really seen yet, but you, we will later. Those are kind of the factors that drove us to not select four, not to select five, but to go with a polyphase system consisting of three elements and therefore a three-phase system, right? And really this has become a global standard. Um, so um, because the three-phase system is a uh, national standard or an international standard really and because the three phases are so in independent, they're almost always described as a single circuit using what are called one-line diagrams. Um, each of the phases is just represented as a single line, and then you know any information that is presented is presented in aggregate. For example, this is showing a distribution feeder that has a load of real power draw of 75 megawatts and a reactive power draw of 23 megavars. That's split amongst the three phases. So that's total power consumption being fed by three different phases. Um, this convention really is used as a simplification method, right? It's much easier to graphically represent circuits using one diagram than it is to draw, you know, all of this. But just recall that, you know, this circuit here actually represents this entire um, electrical behavior. Um, for most, in, for most uh, analysis that we'll do in this class, uh, we'll actually just represent this as a single phase. Um, the only time we're going to have to represent them is three full phases if we have some unbalanced fault conditions, which we'll talk about but not really get into uh, all that much. Um, in the previous description of the advantages of the three phase loads, it was assumed that um, these loads uh, were uh, constant, ZA equals ZB equals ZC. Um, and the term for that is balanced. If the loads are all the same, if the impedance of load A is equal to the impedance of load B is equal to the impedance of load C, um, uh, that's called a balanced system. And so a lot of times these, uh, these one-line diagrams assume that, that condition. But uh, how are those loads balanced if we have, are free to connect to the distribution transformers as we, you know, just kind of at will? Well, um, you know, by nature, certain loads are electrically balanced by design. Large three-phase motors um, draw power equally from each of the phases. So by nature, three-phase motors are already balanced just by their construction. Um, but the majority of residential and small commercial customers typically only draw from a single phase at any time. And so, um, therefore, if you just connected to the utility system at random, um, it wouldn't be, a, the assumption of balance would not be upheld. But as you saw in the previous um, uh, lecture, there is uh, a little bit of planning that goes on in the distribution system, particularly with the timing and um, uh, magnitude of loads. And so it's the, really the job of the utility company's distribution planner to distribute loads on his or her system equally amongst the phases such that uh, the system can be approximately balanced. Oh, excuse me, stay on this slide. Um, for example, a distribution system planning engineer is going to alternate the three phases connecting the houses in a neighborhood. You know, the first house will be connected to phase A, the second house will be connected to phase B, the third house will be connected to phase C, the fourth house will be connected to phase A, the fifth to phase B, the sixth to phase C, etc. When new loads are then added in the area, uh, you know, it's up to that planning engineer uh, to assign the new load. Uh, to the appropriate phase such that it's balanced with the existing load profile. 
Um, I will tell you that in reality, this is a really approximate procedure as our ability to balance loads is really dictated by the size of the load available to us on the system um, and the actual loads connected to the system always fluctuating um, in real time as people turn on and off electric service, really the assumption that ZA equals ZB equals ZC for an aggregate system like represented by a one line diagram, that's a pretty loose approximation. I will say that imbalance in loads really can reach you know, upwards of 10% uh, of the system or 10% of one another. So you know, this may vary between this by 10% or so. Um, when these loads are not equal, the phase currents are no longer going to cancel. And, are, and what that should mean is that a return current will flow. Um, but what if this wire doesn't exist? How does a return current, um, how does a return current then flow, the necessary return current flow, if I remove that wire? Will the system just stop working? What exactly will happen? Um, well, the need for this return current is going to manifest differently in different systems, um, as we'll investigate more fully in a laboratory experiment. Um, but we still got a little bit of work to do mathematically before we can understand the influence of unbalanced uh, loading conditions. So for right now, even though it is an approximation, um, basically for the rest of today, we're just going to assume ZA equals ZB equals ZC, and that kind of simplifies our analysis.